in human being. And um, and so th this kind of speaking, especially as I'm sitting in a room by myself, um, it's not, it's like, doesn't certainly meet my need for comfort or or the kind of vitality that I love to get from human being spaces as I talk to them. And and yet, um, this is these are the days for braver acts of every size. So when the idea of this came up with Thomas and I uh, last week, I thought, um, you know, it's okay. I can, I can deal with this discomfort of this format not being my favorite. So I'm just sort of acknowledging and and that and and really putting out the hope that um, something that each and every person hears today, um, there's something that sticks with you and gives you some support. And that's why we're doing this. We're doing this because you're on the call and we want you to have a sense of connection, support, community, and specifically for me, I'd love you to have some specific tools for how to hang up the phone and relate to yourself, the world, and what's going on in a better way. So I just want to preface that with anything else I want to say. I'm going to share some uh, thoughts. And when I when I when we were talking about how we might spend this precious hour of our lives together, um, it made sense to me to start with suffering, the fact of suffering, the issue of suffering, the ways we can relate to suffering in our lives. Um, so I thought it would be an interesting place to start with suffering, and um, and it's and it's a perfect place as I sit here in in, in the Gandhi Institute for Nonviolence, this house, a formerly abandoned house that was rehabbed into being this beautiful space um, to speak to you about suffering because this house ha, ha, itself held suffering. Um, it was a drug house and. Um, there was violence that happened here, and, and suffering has been transformed in this space. Both Gandhi and King um, reflected, again, repeatedly on the willingness to suffer as an essential tool uh, for creating nonviolent social change. Dr. King named that uh, in his essay, Pilgrimage to Nonviolence, which if you haven't read um, this essay, I, I, I suggest it as good food for the journey. Um, King names suffering willingly undertaken as a redemptive act uh, that builds com movements and community and offers moral authority for our efforts. So the willingness to relate to suffering and think of it as, in a different way than we, we would often think of suffering. Generally, we think of suffering as to be avoided, mitigated, reduced, and both of them had a very different take on suffering. They both from their different religious faiths, you know, Gandhi a devout Hindu, King a devout Christian, both were had a religious framework for relating to suffering as something that could actually be very powerful. So the strategic willingness to suffer was a core tenant for these two, a Hindu and a, and a Christian. Um, me, I identify more as Buddhist these days. I actually tell people I have a Catholic hard drive and Buddhist software. And for me, um, Buddhism's matter-of-fact attitude towards suffering as just a normal, given part of life um, was one of the things that actually first attracted it, me to it well over 25 years ago. Um, it responded directly to the question of suffering in a way that my Catholic upbringing really neglected. So, um, so the, the, the fact of suffering, the issue of suffering has been something that's also been central in my life and my thinking for many years. Um, I had the great gift of being a hospice worker a long time ago and just having the opportunity to witness suffering, um, be, to be close and next to it, and to be a part of it in both the people that were dying as well as their families was an extraordinarily transformative act. So. If any of you have ever thought of being hospice volunteers or have the opportunity to do hospice work, I, I recommend it because it, it will really, I think, give you courage for facing suffering and seeing the extraordinary gifts that are wrapped up in it. Uh, I tend to agree with uh, Franciscan um, 
leader, our Father Richard Rohr, who talks about that love and suffering are the two great paths to transformation. I, I've, that's been my experience in my life. Yeah. But I, I, so I want to, I'm going to speak just a little bit about some of the specific strategies that I've used to relate to suffering in my life, but just want to pause and ask Thomas if there was anything you wanted to add before I keep going. Oh, please keep going. Thank you, Kit. So recognizing that personal and universal unexpressed joy clogs my emotional arteries, um, part of my inner management, I would say, involves ongoing attention to grief. I had a coaching call this morning, and that's what I talked about. Um, I want to make sure that I'm doing what I need to do to recognize grief in me um, and even recognize that there's different parts of me that relate to grief in different ways. There's a sort of an older part of me that has, uh, you know, the, the part of me that hangs on to these moral lessons and spiritual ideals and has a sort of very abs absolute, abstract relation to suffering as something that's interesting, something to re be responded to with curiosity. And then there's a younger part in me that sometimes is just, just scared and just grief struck, doesn't want the world to be like it is. And so one of the things that I try to do is just to be really attentive to both those aspects of me and not override. Because when I'm starting to override, I'm starting to get numb. And the problem with numbness is that there's no such thing as being selectively numb. Where either we get numb to the bad stuff, which might feel good, but then we get numb to the good stuff. You know, we're numb around the people that we love. We're numb to the fact that we're not doing things that help us to thrive. We're numb to the fact that, you know, we're, we're standing outside in the sunshine and we're not even recognizing where we are. There's no such thing as selective numbness, so we need to pay attention to that especially within leadership roles that I've had over the years, whether as a parent or a manager, um, someone's mentor or elder. Um, I really, I know what happens when I choose not to acknowledge grief. I, I inflict it on myself and other people. It's a really painful trickle-down effect. It's all too familiar. And the saddest thing for me about that is the people who are most likely to show up at my funeral <laughs> my husband, my, my my children, my siblings, people in my family, they're the ones who bear the brunt of that. Um, you know, maybe some of you can relate. Um, sometimes I, I save my best self for strangers, for people I don't even know that well. And then I, I go home and fall apart. And... Um, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want that to be my life. I want to be. I want to bring my best self to the people I love. Um, not that I bring an inauthentic self, but I, I don't want to always bring be, bring my exhausted, burned out self to those people I love. I want to also be my full self, full present for them. So I need to pay attention to grief. So here are, are some specific strategies that I've come up with. Um, because for me, actually, despair is an old friend. Um, I remember, um, as, even as a, a teenager, you know, really, really feeling grief struck, grief struck at the world and sometimes and how it can be and, um, you know, learning about the issue of nuclear weapons way back and um, that, that despair, you know, would just lay on my soul sometimes. And... Um, so it's been something that I've been working with and navigating for for a long time. Um, so there there have always been days for me when it felt grueling to be alive in the world. I haven't been gifted to be one of those people that's just happy to be here day in and day out. Some days it's not easy for me to be here. So I'm going to offer up some ideas which um, kind of feel like a handful of pearls. You know, I'm pulling up from the muck of my own life. So <laughs> picture my muddy hand with them a couple of water pearls in it or whatever they're called. So here's one. Um, I suggest you consider not believing your thoughts between midnight and 5 o'clock in the morning. Now Thomas works all night long, so you, Thomas, of course, feel free to ignore this. All of you night owls, you know, adjust, adjust your thinking accordingly. <laughs> But what I'd like to suggest is if your middle of the night conviction, whatever the middle of the night is for you, um, still pays attention at, at your 9 o'clock in the morning, whatever your 9 o'clock is, pay attention then. 
Um, a lot of time, the thoughts that strike me down at one o'clock in the morning, two, two, three, four. Um, you know, I, 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 I hear them, I breathe through them, and I just ask them to take a back seat until the next morning. And then, if by the time I'm having breakfast and I'm kind of back to myself, if that thought is still with me, then I'll pay attention to it then. But other than that, it's just my brain kicking out thoughts, which is my brain's job. And um, but I don't have to pay attention, and I don't have to believe everything my brain thinks. Um, I think it's wise to know for yourself what offers solace, even on your worst days. So if you want to take an intentional homework assignment home from this time, I'd love for you to know for yourself, even on the worst days of my life, what are the things that make me willing to be alive in this world? Maybe even glad to be alive, but certainly I'm looking for willingness. It's like our lower threshold here. And my list that makes me feel willing, not just yeah, willing to feel to be alive, no matter what, includes flowers and green growing things, walking or swimming, vibrant colors, and young people. And there have been times in my life when it was so hard to be alive that I literally carried a piece of paper around in my pocket with those words written down on it. And if and if it was a rough day, and I'm thinking especially. We lost our beloved daughter Molly 10 years ago, and one in the months after she passed away, I carried that piece of paper around with me. And when I, when it wasn't safe for me to kind of keep going, I would just pull that piece of paper out and go find one of those things. Um, there was actually a florist downtown. It's like this really expensive florist in the city of Rochester where I live, and I used to just go hang around there. And for some reason, they let me. I don't know why. They they must not have. They must have been convinced I wasn't a serious threat. Um, and I would just stand there and I would just stare at the flowers and just take in the beauty of, of creation. And it was enough you know, to get me through the day. I want to say grief and your thoughts about grief are not the same thing. Grief and your thoughts about grief are not the same. So I'd love to suggest that you might learn to differentiate between them. Um, I personally choose not to override grief as much as possible when I'm having, when I'm experiencing it, but to literally experience it like painful, beautiful weather. And once it passes, which it does, I can tell you from thousands of experiences of grief in seconds or in minutes sometimes, I don't hang on. I don't keep feeding it with more thoughts. I let it be what it is. Grief and your thoughts about grief are not the same thing. And when your thoughts do run wild, when there's so much fear or anxiety in you, I suggest that you learn to discipline them. And my favorite strategy for that is mem memorizing poetry. Mm. Um, I just love to do that. And then I benefit from having the poems with me as a form of nourishment. And one of my favorites is uh, Zero Circle by Rumi. I imagine a few of you guys might know that. but um, I love the lines, lying helpless, dumbfounded, unable to say yes or no, then a stretcher from grace will come to carry us up. And then the last line that I just treasure is, and we shall be a mighty kindness. I'd like, I want to be a mighty kindness in the world. So, Thomas, anything you want to say before I just, I can just keep talking. Oh, please. I think no one would try and stop you, Kit. I will say one thing quickly, Kit, um, to everyone listening. Um, you'll see there's a question panel. If you're on the, the web, you can um, see there's a question panel there. And feel free to start asking questions as they come to you. Obviously, we'll have some time at the end to answer them and to discuss them with Kit. Oh, is it, was that the fourth one, Kit? Memorize poetry? Is there still one more of your pearls? I think that's it. I think I I think I was bringing four pearls up. Four today. sounds good. Even yeah. number. Yeah. I don't know. You have to decide what's the pearl for yourself. Mm. Um. So, I uh, maybe this is not exactly a pearl, but so another strategy that I have found to be of tremendous support over the years is what I call living between my stories. And um, and I owe this awareness to a public radio interview I heard uh, long ago out in Oakland, California, 
that I tuned into with author Mary Catherine Bateson, who's Margaret Meads and Gregory Bateson's daughter. Um, and I was listening to her, and it was one of those you know radio interviews that captures you so much that when you get to where you're going and you're driving, you just stay in the car, you don't get out, you just keep listening. Hmm. Um, and in the in the radio interview, um, she, Bateson described having these two coexisting narratives about her life going all the time. And since hearing her, I've paid attention to my inner stories and discovered that the same is true for me. Uh, depending on my audience and depending on my resilience in the moment, one or the other narrative will occupy center stage. I just wonder if any of you have ever noticed anything like that. Um, when I feel good or in the presence of someone I don't know well or I want to impress someone, my shiny narrative, I call the shiny narrative, quote unquote, emerges. It's the good stuff you know, about what's going on. But when my internal resources feel low or when I'm in the company of a sympathetic friend or ear, the narrative that emphasizes challenges and worries generally emerges. The important thing I notice is that when I'm speaking from either space, it feels like my whole reality. So, I, and I forget that the other reality was just as present maybe just minutes or hours ago in that other setting. Um, that, this understanding has been really essential for me to recall when my thinking is consumed with grief or despair. Um, I've disciplined myself over the years to look for the other narrative. And from this practice over the years, um, in particular, as well as the others I've just named, I personally have come to see that despair is a form of arrogance. I see despair as a form of arrogance because it implies that I somehow know the outcome of, of a situation which I existentially, of course, cannot. And since despair about world situations is such an old friend, this awareness really offers me strength and clarity during hard times. Um, I call these like ant on a picnic blanket moments, which is when I'm, I, if you can imagine an ant crawling across a picnic blanket, you know, and they see one red thread and maybe part of a blue thread and they see the whole, they, for that for that ant, that's the whole picture. I'm always experiencing myself like an ant on a picnic blanket. I never know the whole picture. I won't and I can't. And actually that's comforting. I also, this, this awareness also helps to make me a more conscious consumer of the media. Because I notice which of my stories are fed and by whom. I'm curious as to what is the benefit and who benefits when we're afraid, when the media supports us to be afraid or to not trust each other. Who benefits? Um, I think that's an important thing to pay attention to. And uh, I really highly recommend Yes Magazine as a media resource that highlights innovation and positivity, positive, positivity and systemic change. Um, we need to hear good stuff about each other. We need to feel good about ourselves as a species. So, um, I've got more to say about all this stuff too, but um, I can stop. Sure. Well, we have a, a couple of questions here, actually, Ken. Okay. Uh, the first one should be pretty quick, actually, and there's something I was going to ask you as well. What's, what was the name of that essay that you recommended at the beginning? I just want to write that down. The one by King? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's his essay, Pilgrimage to Nonviolence. Mm. Thank you. And we have a question here which says, how do you deal with fear in troubling times? Uh, I thank it first. Um, it's trying to help me stay alert and pay attention to something that's important for me to pay attention to. So uh, I, I try not to dismiss anything that my organism is trying to offer me, any feeling, anything. Um, so I, I, first thing I just try to acknowledge anything that's happening. I, I try to acknowledge it to myself like I would acknowledge it if another person brought it to me. Um, and then I just breathe because I recognize that when fear is in my heart or in my mind, I'm likely depriving myself of oxygen. My breath is going to get shallow, which is going to lead, you know, kind of um, do a reinforcing loop of feeling unsafe. Um, 
So I, I, I pay attention to my body. I, I greet my, my feelings respectfully. I don't dismiss them. Um, and I also try not to dwell on them, but just kind of am, am with them. Um, yeah, I mean, fear and anxiety, I, I, don't, I don't tend to have as much. You know, I just go straight to despair. <laughs> it's like someone who doesn't do mixed cocktails. I just do shots, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I like this idea of thinking it, um, and those kind of negative emotions can often be calls to action. Um, you know, and worry can be a reminder that you might not feel prepared uh, for something to be worried about. Something yeah. you might not feel like you're ready enough to take on that thing, whatever that I might be. I want to actually put out, I don't think that there's any such thing as a negative emotion. Mm. It's information. It's, it's, it's something that's helping me. It's wanting to help me. Like, I'll tell you what, you know when I feel fear? Sometimes it's when someone compliments me. Mm. I was a keynote speaker last night at this big community event, and, um, you know, these people were walking past me, and they were saying, oh, that was great, it was a good job, and I just was starting to get so anxious because I actually don't enjoy, um, we'll, we'll talk about feedback hopefully another time, but I really don't enjoy compliments. <laughs> um, it's like approval that can be either given or withdrawn, and I don't trust if they're genuine because people you know, have been so conditioned to be polite and not speak their minds. So mm -hmm. I need observations in order to feel safe personally. So, you know, like people yesterday, I grabbed them, and this lady in the restroom, I followed her into the restroom. She said, oh, that was great, and I thought, and I said, what did I do that you think is great? I bugged a couple people like that before I felt easy enough to be able to go home. Mm. Mm. I hear that. So it's interesting. As someone who might want to compliment you one day, Kurt, um, are you suggesting that when people provide compliments to other people to make them land better um, and be more readily absorbed? Um, we should start with an observation. So I might say, um, that point you made about memorizing poetry, you know, I, I'm going to do that. I really, I'm really grateful you mentioned that as a strategy for dealing with my suffering. Great. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that helps me to like hear because I when when some and that's why I like I love to be specific and not speak in generalities if I can, because I know for myself, you know, I respond. It's easier for me to take in specific thoughts or ideas rather than sweeping philosophy. Although mm -hmm. sweeping philosophy also, of course, has its place. Um, but yeah, I'm, that's the kind of thing I'm glad to hear. And also, you know, like this week I had eight uh, talks and lectures that I gave. So mm -hmm. when I hear what people like, it helps me to know how to make to make sure that I might, you know, name that again another time because I want to be effective. And sometimes I only have five minutes for the group, like today or last night was 20 minutes. You know, today was 20 mm -hmm. minutes. So I want to know what works for people. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's a, probably a good message for everyone today, in fact. If, you, uh, if there's something that you liked, <laughs> let us know. The feedback is welcome. We want to, um, about this, you know, this session we're having to, this conversation. And of course, anything that Kit said, any feedback for Kit. Because I certainly like those four pearls. I think the metaphor was wonderful. And uh, I wrote all of them down. So I'm very grateful for you sharing those. Um, just wow, a quick that's moment. great. I thought you'd yeah. already heard everything I had to say about everything. That's great. That's part of the reason they were doing this, Kit. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't feel selfish. Um, learning as much as I can from you, and I'm so grateful that we're able to share this with so many people from around the world. And this is going to be this is being recorded, in fact. So um, we yeah, can share it with our own friends. It's really cool that we had basically that you all are with us today with like 48 mm -hmm. hours notice. So <laughs> that's when we started marketing it two days ago. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Um, you know, just to remind again, please do ask some questions. Um, I have one for Kit now about this blanket. I love that metaphor. The ant can only see, you know, one or two of the threads at any one moment, and this sense of the greater whole. Uh, I'm just curious if you're on that blanket though, and you're getting some news, or you're smelling smoke. That part of the picnic blanket might be on fire. It might not be, but you know, you're worried about the the blanket, and you can't see it all, or you can like. You're getting signals from the media, you know, your antenna, which may or not be serving you. Um, you know, 
the unknown, I guess, is more of a, a question I have around that. So what, how do you, and I guess your Buddhist philosophy there would kick in when it comes to being more philosophical about the unknown? or um, Well, a couple of thoughts. Um, I remember uh, just after the the events of September 11th here in the United States years ago now, um, I was at this interfaith gas gathering at a, at a Muslim mosque, and it was a, you know, this we're we're just about five and a half hours away from New York City, and this they were still pulling bodies from the rubble, and um, it was such a scary it was a scary time then as it is now, and you know certainly, and um, and I heard this this extraordinary thing from this Muslim man who's had a lot of suffering and wisdom in his life and someone asked him how to respond and he 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 offered up that people of faith can be most useful when they cool down and get humble so um and what i'm i, I don't and i didn't just interpret that to be people of of a particular religious faith i people of faith people who believe in humanity or people who believe in nonviolence, or people who just believe in the future on behalf of the descendants. Um, we can we can be often most useful when we cool down, meaning we're not heated uh, with our own ideas or concerns. We we do what we need to get the support to be able to kind of drop some of all that those storylines and just pay attention to what's happening. Um, Again, this is something I imagine we'll talk about in another one of these sessions, but I do think of curiosity as the meta skill for nonviolence. So I get quiet, see what I can do, and then also pay attention to, you know, what I'm afraid of. What am I, if I'm afraid of something and I can do, and I can move toward it, I do. Um, if, if, you know, if I'm afraid of a conversation, if I'm afraid of a certain group of people, um, I want to, I want to, um, walk towards that fear as much as I can. So I have a friend like right now uh, who's really deeply worried about the state of the world for very, very good reason. Um, he's Muslim, he's African American, and he and his family are, um, you know, wondering about if they're heading towards a concentration camp in the in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, right now I'm just spending time with him and, um, you know, talking about what it's like and, you know, how we can be in solidarity. And, um, you know, all we can do is just uh, be with each other and keep listening for what are the possibilities. Um, I think in this season of, of rhetoric and, and fear, too, I, I'm, I'm daily, every day, more than once a day, really nourished by something that Dr. King said, um, and I think he might have said it just after his house was bombed in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. He There was a lot of energy um, to protect his person and his family, his home at that time, and he, he didn't want there to be a lot of energy diverted from the movement to protecting him. And he, he said that um, we need to not put our attention so much on on the personalities here. You know, he says our human tendency is to put like 90% of our attention on the personality. Who said this? Who said what? You know, oh my God, this person, that person. He said, and only maybe 10% of our attention on the issues. I'm looking at a picture of him while I'm saying this. I think he would like that I'm saying this right now. Um, he said, that's kind of a way to continue the status quo. 90% of the attention on personalities. You know, this is the current police chief who we're all hating on, or this is the current person in office, you know, whoever. And and if we're we're not paying attention to the underlying issues, we're not being strategic. So his advice was to swap it. Ninety percent of our attention on the issues. What's the underlying issue here? You know, if we're afraid of each other right now, who's benefiting? What's the most creative thing we can do with each other right now to deal with this? So that's if I'm if I smell burning, I try to I try to kind of move into that mode, 
And then I try to think of who do I know? Who, who can I pick up the phone? Who can I call? You know, what are the unusual relationships I have that might do something about the situation? Thank you, Kit. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Um, one is talking about the difference of grief and our thoughts about grief. Can you share more about the difference there between our thoughts and the experience of grief? Yeah. Um, I mean, I know, I imagine everybody here knows something about grief. We don't, you know, we're all, all of us are going to lose our own lives and everyone around us is going to die. Hoping that's not news to anybody on the call. Um, <laughs> if it is, I'm terribly sorry. Let's talk afterwards. And there is a Santa Claus. Um, but for me, you know, sometimes I'm just knocked out by grief. You know, I see I see someone that reminds me of someone that I love, or I hear a piece of music. Um, you know what I'm talking. It's like the stuff that just comes into your lives. And suddenly you're just back into the space of just loss, mm -hmm. complete loss. Um, and that's what I mean by grief. It's not it's not a mental, you know. It's it's just like uh, suddenly the music's you know the music's on the radio in that store, or the shape of this person's face or the back of their head, and suddenly you're just knocked out by loss or grief. Um, and that, that's what I mean by an experience of grief. It just, just comes in uninvited in the middle of other things. And, you know, when you've just lost somebody, your whole life is composed of those moments. And I think the process of healing from grief is that those moments are just spaced further out. But they never go away entirely, I don't think. Not, not when there's – I just – I'm not sure about that. I'm not done yet. I'll let you know when I'm dying what I think about that. But that's, that's, my, that's my conjecture at this point, that they, these moments don't go away, they just they just space out. So that's, that for me is grief. Now, the thoughts about grief are, if I'm in the, standing in the store, this particular music piece of music comes on that just takes me right back to a particular place where, where something difficult happened, where something tragic happened. Um, there's the music. And I, you know, I either leave the space to not hear the music or the music ends. There's my emotional reaction that I'm having. And, um, and then I usually subside. And what, what, I pay, what I notice is that it, I can tell it's subsiding when another thought comes in, like, oh, look at that red coat over there. You know, when other thoughts start to come in, I have a choice. I can continue to kind of put logs on the fire and say, oh, my God, I can't believe they're gone. Or I can just breathe and follow my the animal of my attention that's starting to get curious again about the world. I'm, oh, look at that. Look at that. If I'm in a store, look at the, the red coat's cool, but I love that purple coat. You know, I just, I just follow my attention rather than stay lost in my thoughts. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. Thank you. Um, you were talking before about a friend of yours. Um, and this idea of a, you know, this, these concentration camps, um, you know, for, for Muslims around, certainly in the possibility in the US or becoming more possible. And uh, in terms of like a Muslim registry or something, we have a question here saying, can you share what's arising for you and strategies you are imagining be the possibility of a Muslim registry? Um, I want everybody to register. That's all I can say right now. I mean, if, if they have to register, I'm going to register. I'm going to find a way to register. And I will stop paying all my taxes. Um, we, I've done some tax resistance, but the government can only keep going with our money. We don't give it. It's going to be harder for them to persecute our brothers and sisters. So I think massive tax resistance, and we're all going to register as Muslims would be two ideas. Um, I don't know the practicality of that yet, but um, I will. Um, I'm not. They're not going anywhere without me. 
And um, if the whole, if everybody, everybody's willing to go into the camps, then who's going to be on the outside doing the work? So that's one thought. Sure. Um, and by the way, I had a wonderful time. Um, I've been preparing to go to jail for years. And, by, and it's a good thing to prepare for. So if you haven't thought about going to jail yet, please do. And I have this wonderful uh, set of instructions from uh, another one of my heroes, Dr. Bernard Lafayette, who was a colleague of King's and very engaged with Student on Violent Coordinating Committee. He was, he was arrested 26 times back in the day during the Civil Rights days. And just continued his nonviolence work. Bernard Lafayette, let's look him up. Anyways, he told me what you have to do when you go to jail. And uh, ever since then, I've felt pretty cheerful because I know what I'm going to do. Um, I'm not going to share it because it's his story. Um, and so I wouldn't share it on this call because I asked him if he's ever written it down. And he said he hasn't. He just tells it orally. And I don't want to be one of those white people that doesn't respect the oral tradition of another people. So I'm not going to say it. But... I invite you to figure out for yourselves what's your plan for being incarcerated because once you kind of have a plan for it, the idea of it will take the fear down. And what's your plan for when you're going to die? Because you will anyway. So what do you want your life to mean to you then? And I, for me, like once you kind of have those things sort of looked at, then like more things are less terrifying. <laughs> More things are less terrifying. <laughs> Ooh, I love it. Um, we have a question here which says, other than the four pearls of wisdom that you shared, what small action slash step can individuals do to move people and communities towards peace and away from grief and anger and fear? What small steps can individuals do to move communities and people towards peace? Um, boy, there's so many things. People are so hungry for, for good news and kindness. And um, so I say um, get people off away from their screens and get them interacting with each other more. Um, share food with people. Um, do surprising things. Buy someone else's, you know, like, Bread of loaf of bread in the grocery line. Um, you know, just just do amazing things for the human beings around you, with no need for recognition or anything. Do it for its own sake, without attachment to outcomes. And watch what happens to your heart, and pay attention to the feedback that you get. Um, so getting to people together to do lovely, surprising things for each other. Um, finding spaces for dialogue. Uh, I, you know, racism runs through just about every injustice in this country. And so um, we, if, if um, you know, you're someone like me that was born into Caucasian skin in the United States, You've been handed privileges your whole life that you may not recognize. Um, I strongly urge you to get educated about that. And we could even spend a whole another one of these sessions talking about th that issue because I love talking about this stuff. It's one of my biggest mm -hmm. passions. So get educated. Um, there's also um, get educated, listen to people, bring people together. Um, I would say use your money to empower, um, especially younger people. Um, you know, what kind of project could the kids in your faith community or your neighborhood do if you if they had five hundred dollars to work with? Um, you know, like just do creative, outrageous things. Um, bring in the arts music and everything. Um, go go knock on people's doors that you don't know and say you want to build a better community and what what do they think and listen. Mm -hmm. Try to stay try to stay 
unattached to your own ideas and strategies and just be a person who helps bring other people's thoughts forward. That's a huge gift. Those are some ideas. That's lovely, yeah. Tomorrow, um, sorry, tomorrow I'm, I, I'm doing a workshop here in Rochester called Let's Talk About Hate. Mm. And I want, I want us to want people to be less fearful of hate. And I've been doing those here for a few months. So any gathering where you're bringing people together to talk deeply is a good thing. Mm. And there's been an observation there's quite a lot of um, divisiveness um, here in the U.S. recently and obviously in other parts of the world. And um, I, some of those same strategies you just outlined um, I'm sure will be applied to healing this divisiveness and moving people towards collaboration. But are there any specific things when you have a, a group of people who um, you are witnessing some divisiveness in the group or in a relationship? Um, have you got any pointers for how we can bring those people together and get them to start collaborating with each other instead of arguing? Yes, tons. Let's talk about it next week. <laughs> 20, sure. minutes, 20 minutes won't even touch it. Um, <laughs> but I will say, um, let's see, what, what's, what's one thing I can say on that? There's, there's a lot. Mm -hmm. Um... I would say um, one thing that you can offer is uh, a framework and you can bring it in yourself when you're having a difficult time with somebody or you can pay attention to it as a dynamic in groups. Uh, oftentimes when there's um, you can pay attention to the dynamic of intention versus impact especially in diverse groups, diverse age groups, racial groups, religious groups, uh, class groups. We, we act some, we don't talk a lot about class in the United States, but there's a very different set of operating instructions depending on what class you're, you're from. And generally who, you know, the people in the room who tend to have the most class status, their rules are the operating rules for the group. Um, in my experience. So a framework that I really love uh, relates to the a whole issue of intention versus impact. And this is something that you can look up and learn more about, but mm -hmm. intention versus impact, which is that, you know, one person says or does something that, that deeply upsets or offends the other person. And uh, what happens after that is that the person who who said or did the thing they want, they're protesting, they want to be seen for their intentions, their innocence, they're, they're, they were just trying to be honest, they were just trying to contribute. The person on the other side of this dynamic, um, they're actually not interested, they're just too upset. They only want to be seen for the impact that this other person's choice had on them. Mm. That, that, that other person's intentions are immaterial to that person. All they want to be understood for is what the effects were. Mm. A lot of, lot of issues with gender going on right now in, in, the, with, in relation to this, too. I just actually stood with someone uh, an hour ago at this uh, community event that I mentioned that I did just before this event. And a woman, this woman came up to me, and I know she's been uh, through a lot lately. And I said, how are you doing? She said, I'm so exhausted. She said, and just yesterday, it's like more things keep piling on my list. Just yesterday, I went to a meeting. With, and there was a, this wonderful guy there who was a doctor, and he showed up with this tie on that had all these really traditional racist images of Thanksgiving on it. You know, the Indians and the, you know, just all these this kind of stuff that was so not relating to the reality of what actually happened when, uh, you know, people of European descent showed up on this continent and acted like it was uninhabited. <laughs> And uh, and she just said, "I'm just so exhausted now. How am I? You know, now is another thing. I, I know I see this guy with a tie. What am I going to do? You know." And she, and I said, "So, what I'm getting is that you know, there's a sense of another, yet another demand on your energy." And she said, "Right." 
and I said, and, and not feeling that at even that choice of no, knowing how to respond. And she said, right, I, it's like one more thing I now I have to do. Mm. And I said, I can imagine, you know, when you have the energy for it, that you could just approach him and say, you know, I love the intention that you have to connect in a, in a child with the children that you work with and, and have playful, bright clothes on so that they can really feel connected and, and with you. And at the same time, I want you to know that there may be effects that that particular tie I saw you have on Friday have that may not be visible for you, which is a, a tie like that for someone in you know the Native American community here would be really a painful symbol. Um, their their experience of Thanksgiving as a holiday is is markedly different than than the white Euro American narrative. And I know you care deeply about people and that you, you know, very well may have people, you know, I live in Iroquois country, like you may very well people have people from, of Native American descent, whether they're Iroquois or other tribes, that maybe you're patients and you just don't even know. And I know you, you would never want to hurt or offend anyone, ever. So I just wanted to let you know the effect that that tie had on me and my worry that of the effect it might have on other people. So um, she she listened and she said, I can do that. That I can do because I'm not making him wrong. And I said, yeah. So, anyways, there's an idea. Thank you. Well, our time is almost up, Kit. So, there's a few things I'd like to do before we go. We'll end with some gratitude again. Um, but for everyone listening, um, we've mentioned about future web um, sort of these conversations that we're having online together. And if you've got any ideas um, or requests for specific topics that you'd be interested in hearing Kit talk about and us discuss together. Um, you can Which we may or may not do, by the way. Which we may or may not do. <laughs> um, <laughs> but please do um, email in um, any ideas um, and, of course, any feedback that you have um, for us on this. Um, tell yes, your friends. Des desperate for feedback. It's been desperate weird and feedback. lonely to sit in this room by myself. <laughs> so to cure Kit's weird and loneliness, please do send feedback. And also tell your friends where this conversation will be happening on Saturdays at the same time. Um, there's a list of dates on where you signed up and we'd love everyone to experience this and to benefit from this work. So please do um, let your friends know. You'll be getting an email in about an hour, I believe, automatically and that will allow you to sort of forward that on to anyone and they can um, sign up and, and, and listen on these as well. Um, and we will finish with a bit of gratitude, Kit. And obviously, Kit works at the Ghana Institute for Nonviolence. And Kit, I'd be interested to hear something from you about that's happened at the Ghana Institute this week um, that you're particularly grateful for. I'll, I'll just start by saying, um, if you haven't been to the Ghana Institute yet, um, it's, it's an amazing place to visit. And the energy in that building that has been very consciously created is um, an amazing thing to experience. I'm very grateful for every time I walk into that building and the feeling of peace um, and love and inclusiveness that I experience from in that building. And obviously witnessing all the amazing work that you're doing there, Kit. So, Kit, what's something this week that you're grateful for? Um, kind of related. Um, and I think I want people to know that the context of the Gandhi House isn't, you know, just in some beautiful place. We're... we're you know, the house is located in a neighborhood with shootings, uh, a lot of poverty, um, and so the, the, the fact of this being the energy of the space um, and, and, and the context of that um, is, I want, I, that matters to me a lot because there's, there's young people here every single day, in and out, doing wonderful things, older people here, in and out, so it's not a peaceful place because it's not busy, and it's not a peaceful place because it's in some lovely spot. It's in a rather gritty neighborhood in a rather gritty old city in the Northeast. The thing that I'm grateful for, it relates to, um, so I have some people from a, a, a city school district, or from a school district outside Ithaca, New York, come and visit us uh, this week. They were here for the morning. They met several of our staff and visited one of our school sites to learn what we're doing and to make a plan for how they might address issues for building student leadership, addressing school climate, addressing issues of racism in their school district. 
And with, as they were leaving, they said, you know, it was remarkable that every single person that we met from your place, literally they, they beam. They're like, mm -hmm. they're, they, it was so extraordinary. Each and the, the quality of presence of each one. And I hope, by the way, you'll go on our website, GaudiInstitute.org, and look at our page, team, our team page, because the, then you can see the, the, the lovely individuals that I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. And and I said to them, what you're seeing in part is the benefit of working in a high trust environment. So we'll definitely be having one of these calls focusing on building trust between people and the effects mm -hmm. that it can have. Absolutely. Well, well thank you, Kit. And um, thank you, for everyone, for coming today. Um, if you'd like to support the work of the Art Institute that Kit's doing, please do go to the website. Check out their amazing work. Um, everything about that place beams. So um, please consider making a donation to um, help Kit and her colleagues continue that great work. Um, I'm looking forward to the next one, Kit. So um, thank you for your time today and, and for sharing with us um, your thoughts and wisdom on these important matters. Me too. And let's maybe next week we can spend some time um, going back to the question that that person had about like working effectively in groups. Let's spend mm -hmm. some time on that because I know a lot of people are organizing and trying to get get things get things moving. So let's let's spend some time next week looking at building effective, efficient groups. Sounds awesome. All right, Kit, speak to you soon. Thank you again, everybody. Thanks all.